Um, welcome everybody to uh, Friday, June 5th uh, meeting of the House General, General Housing and Military Affairs of the House of Representatives of the State of Vermont. Um, we are uh, gathered here today with many of the advocates and representatives from the administration who have testified before us over the last several weeks. Um, I did send an email out earlier today to the committee basically uh, continuing the conversation we started yesterday on the actual, working on the actual appropriations of the, of, uh, the money that, the CRF money that has been allocated to housing. Uh, again, as a reminder, we've been allocated up to $70 million in tier, what's being called tier one spending, which is um, a proposal that we're gonna put together by Wednesday and See, David Halls is joining us now. Um, and then we have up to $50 million to spend after that in what's called tier two spending, which will only be, which will only happen after we find out what happens to um, the $400 million that the General Assembly expects to keep in reserve until we find out if we can spend that money on other um, items that we, that we talked about yesterday which was education, transportation, and the general fund. Um, to top that off this morning, I talked with the speaker. There is, uh, there is going to be worked on now in the Senate, and it's, called, it's considered a fast-track bill, and it's an attempt to get money out even a little bit faster than what we would be expecting if we were just simply to turn in our, our proposal by June 10th. And what that would mean is, and what, what, that, what I've been asked to do is to take a, a portion of our 70, um, there's a 75 million uh, first tier money and to carve it off and uh, to carve off a piece of that and suggest an amendment to the Senate bill, which would be happening on Monday and Tuesday uh, to get money out the door even faster. We've, heard, we've taken testimony from um, Gus Selig at VHCB, from Representative CHT, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, and others that there are potential units that have been made available or that have been identified as potential purchases uh, that action can be taken fairly quickly on. And there are other projects as well that, we, um, that we're aware of, but not, not certainly of all the paperwork that's been done or proposed, but um, the first part of this conversation today, I want us to discuss um, the notion of telling uh, David to draw up some language that we would approve that would then go over to the Senate. Um, and again, the proposal would be to get this, the ball rolling on, on the purchase of units and the rehabilitation of units um, to assist in the transition. So that's, that's the first part. Um, but I see David, again, David has joined us. Um, does anyone have any, I, mean, I, I just, I think I'm just gonna start off with, does anyone have any objections to us taking a number and the number that has been, um, that I put in the email today was to say $23 million, which was about the money. I mean, the, the numbers that BHCB had been sharing with us prior to now had been $21.7 million that may not have, that, that, that may not have included other projects we'd heard about um, or the potential for other projects that we had heard about, including um, potential purchases by Champlain Housing Trust. And, um, and then we heard a little bit about the uh, programs in Rutland, for instance, or, uh, or the mobile home project uh, from, from HFI. Not that there's a guarantee that any of these projects would get that money, but that, that, but that there are, there's going to be more demand than the 21.7. And so, um, my proposal is to take $23 million and have it um, suggested in an amendment to the Senate as fast track money. We would still be putting together a proposal for the remaining um, $52 million that would be proposed by Wednesday. Um, but does anyone have any objections to draw, having David draw up some language or have some language for us that we can consider that would be we would be able to share with the Senate. And again, you know, House rules. If you want to rate, if you want to come and please raise your hands and and unmute yourself uh, when I call on you, Representative Kalaki. Thank you, Chair. I, do, I just want to make sure I understand. So 
the proposal that is uh, on our committee page right now from HCB. So the, it, it, is pathways included in this? Is the mobile home park, um, could they apply for these funds? And the other um, regional, regionally specific things, uh, it seems to me, I, I just wanna make sure I'm clear. They could all apply for these funds if it was in fact, uh, capitalizing new buildings, right? Uh, yes, I mean, and, and Gus, if you want to weigh in on that, because uh, I think there's two there's two answers. It's both yes and no, um, if I'm not mistaken. But go ahead, Gus. Do you want to answer, Gus? He froze. So, um, John, I mean, Jen, do you need, do you want to weigh in, Jen? I can, and I will um, concur that um, sort of two really answers. If, um, no, he's coming in and out. Okay. He doesn't know that he's been cut, that he's, that he can't be heard. Okay. Can I go ahead? Yeah, I'm going to try to mute him. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, so um, the HFI proposal, because it's capital to create new units, they would um, be able to apply if, if this funding were to um, go forward. And um, we would assess that based on how it lines up where there's the greatest need according to AHS data and right. suitability for what they're recommending um, as it compares to the needs of the households that would be served. Um, the pathways proposal, while we think that housing first services are really important and are going to be part of the overall solution, um, the recommend that would not, that's a, a services component and then, um, would need to be addressed by the legislature separately because what VHCB is proposing and our role in sort of the housing world is to um, provide capital, um, the bricks and mortar, the creating the units, rehabbing units. So um, the HFI would be something that could come to us. Um, the pathways proposal is not the kind of thing that VHCB funds or you would be asking us to do. Um, okay. What we would do if you move forward with this um, and we're preparing to be able to do this, it, uh, if that's what the committee and the legislature decides to do. So we would put out a request for letters of interest um, and invite people to respond. And HFI mm -hmm. would be one of the um, entities we would invite to respond. All right, and just one, one clarification. So the pathways was to expand their services to other towns that they're not currently in. So there's no capital needs in that expansion. It's all services. I know you're not pathways, Jen, but I, 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 I John, I think the answer to that is, is yes. Um, they, it's, it's a proposal to expand. Um, it's, it's an expo, it, it's a proposal to expand their services statewide. And then there's another million dollars that was a part of the request component that would actually provide the uh, rental assistance or other services that they okay. would need. I got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Representative Hengo. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that the fast track um, money that we're talking about, um, actually not the money, the fast track proposal that we're talking about, do you want to get that out by the end of today? Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Yes, that would be ideal. Um, and I will pop David. David Hall, are you, can you join us for a minute? Yes, for, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, Sorry, I'm, uh, yes, sir, what's up? Hi, David Hall, Legislative Council. Welcome. Um, you, you, I can't believe you have gray beards. Um, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so David, um, we have not really had an opportunity to work with you directly on, uh, on the work that you've done over the last week or so on the, the package that you were asked to put together based on the, starting with the administration's proposal. Um, but I really want to separate out the conversation for a minute and talk about what it would take 
on the legal end in terms of what, what would be the language that we would then share with the Senate in terms of saying, I mean, the, the Senate can make up their own, I suppose, but this is part of the, they haven't been taking as, as much uh, testimony on, on housing issues as we have, but so, so we've been asked to kind of take this, this $23 million chunk um, and draft a, an amendment that can be shared with the Senate, much like we did with S-333. And so I'm just curious, like, what is it from, what would we need from you in order to have something to look at or to, to vote on? Uh, well, I just for need, that, just for that small piece. I would need to write it. Um, I have, uh, I, I know that I have somewhere uh, the proposal. I, I, I actually just asked Jen if she could just send me what the most concurrent proposal is so I could base language on that. I'll, I'll tell you that I, Senate Economic Development has just voted out um, sort of the phase one emergency grants program through tax and commerce. It's a, I mean, it's a six page-ish bill that just basically says $50 million to tax to give money to businesses immediately that meet these criteria, you come up with the formula, you come up with the amount within these guidelines and parameters. It's very straightforward. Same with commerce, it's $20 million for everybody else. And so um, at this point, it's pretty straightforward drafting. It's quick, it's short, it's sweet, it's money uh, for, you know, the purpose and you know, you know, a, a basic statement that says whatever we do with this, we have to be sure it complies with the CARES Act. So, so in terms of um, in terms of any kind of direction that we would give to VHCB, it would basically say, if I heard you correctly, it would basically say um, twenty three million dollars is appropriated to VHCB for the following, you know, in order to capitalize the purchase of units, um, if we want to write an emphasis on family units or um, uh, to, to, to say that we want to make sure that projects are, I mean, are, are, are what? I mean, I'm, I'm just yeah, I'm no, fishing I, here. I, okay, I hear what you're saying. Um, so uh, my, 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 I guess my fundamental legal guidance under the CARES Act, the guidance issued pursuant to the CARES Act and the FAQs is that um, the money be used to provide assistance to individuals, uh, you know, in response to, due to, uh, because of, necessary, due to the public health emergency, right? So. Mm -hmm. If we are going to do anything with housing, we have to be able to, first in the legislation, but also actually in the implementation, we have to be sure that we can draw the straight line that runs from people who are experiencing adverse health and economic impacts due to the crisis. And then that line runs right to here is the housing and or services that we are providing on or before December 30th to respond to those health and economic needs that are due to the crisis. So it's not a hard lift. You know, a lot of people have a lot of need and for both health and economic reasons, we certainly have the flexibility as a state to say what we think a necessary and appropriate expenditure of those funds is um, where we may, where we would potentially run into problems is where, um, you know, the that direct line, that that direct nexus between harm and remediation of effects due to the crisis begins to blur into things like we want more market rate housing or we just need more housing units. Right. I mean, we can have both, right? And the guidance uh, is clear that the state can own and keep assets. We can give economic assistance to people to provide shelter, address homelessness, 
um, economic impacts. We can do all of these things. And, you know, those benefits can continue beyond December 30th, but we have to take all the action and the action all has to be in response to the crisis with sort of a remedial uh, basis more than anything else, because that's the way the guidance is structured. This is designed to respond to harm that has occurred during this period because of the pandemic. Right. So we're saying, um, we're, we're saying, I mean, we, there's a, there's a tough question here between the word in, in the language capacity versus, versus need, the remedial need. Um, you know, even though we have to create units that, that face that remedial need, I think I've heard you say that that's okay. I mean, we're not taking, we're not, we're not focusing on another area of, of housing needs, which we know there are plenty, yeah. and, but we're, we're addressing this specific need with this, with this money. And that's, and, and, and those needs are covered in some of the overarching language in the bill that already, that, that, that the Senate's working on. Mm, to a the, less through, the through line that you're talking, the through line that you're talking well, about. So there, there's, there's less, uh, I would say that as far as the flexibility given for uh, direct economic support to businesses, I would say that that is the most permissive uh, potential use of coronavirus funds. Uh, the guidance and the FAQs are explicit that is within the discretion of the state to decide what is necessary and how they help businesses. And, you know, as long as the harm, the business, uh, incurred was due to the crisis, you're good. The, uh, the, 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 the issue I'm raising in housing is that it's just, it's simply that the population of people being served and the activity doing the serving um, is in response to harm caused by the crisis to that individual. So if you wanted to build or renovate housing it could be for the purpose of housing a homeless person, um, moving a homeless person from temporary to some other temporary or permanent housing to mitigate health and economic impacts. It could be um, for you know, buying or building new housing as long as the person you're housing has that need. It could be moving a person from a current uh, housing situation that is unsafe for some reason due to the pandemic to some other housing situation. For instance, there were overcrowding, uh, two families living in one dwelling unit. Um, I don't know what, I mean, use your imagination, but again, uh, the need has to be due to the crisis. That's all. And it's in, in the, so the line is between the population, the need and the response. So the so the VHCB proposal was more specifically again I think as Jen started to talk started to explain was for capital expenses again we've talked about this about the the um, opportunities to purchase units yeah. um, and Gus can you speak for a minute uh, if if you're if you're not fuzzy um, can you speak for a minute on the language that you just that that just showed up on our on our page. Um, it's, it's appropriation style lang uh, language. And I think it's, it may be a little bit broad for the fast track purposes, but I think it captured what David's talking about. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chairman, we'd be happy also, um, and see a direct line. And that was the instructions when we were first asked to consider this, um, between the crisis, uh, the fact that 2000 Vermonters are in motels. They were put in motels because the situations they were in were not safe and healthy, and we can't go back to those situations. So we're trying to create some safer alternatives for those households. And we, we certainly would be happy to work with council and make sure that that line is as clear as possible and also have that reflected in any solicitations we make of letters of interest from our community partners. Okay. Representative Hengo. Thank you. I just want to um, ask David just to be sure that I heard him correctly that the 
the parameters that we're working with are to, with this money, are to help people who, because of a direct result, because of this crisis, um, we need to rehouse them. But we've kind of already done that. And I know that it's not a sustainable model economically or socially, um, but how can we justify building new or rehabbing old properties to move people again as being a direct result of COVID-19? I just wanna make sure that we're going down the right road. Sure, I, I, I hear you. Um, so I, I, again, I, I think there is uh, a fair amount of discretion in the guidance to states and local units of government to decide what is necessary uh, and what is necessary due to the public health emergency. Um, and, you know, to that end, to speak to that flexibility, I mean, states, local governments do not have to pre approve with Treasury on how they're going to spend the money. Um, there's a, in fact, there's a specific answer to an FAQ that says the Treasury is depending on the judgment and expertise of states and local governments to determine what the appropriate use of the funds is within the parameters. Um, so I think there's a lot of discretion as long as, you know, you're responsive to the terms of the act and the guidance. I, I, I see your point that, you know, uh, we had a population of people who were not housed at all, and they're currently being housed on a temporary basis. Um, does that end the equation? Uh, are they housed and now we're done? I don't, I don't think we need to, uh, I wouldn't read it that narrowly. I mean, you know, as your attorney, I'm not here to tell you yes or no, you can or cannot do something. What I want to be explicit with this committee as I have been with every other committee is to tell you that there is a continuum of risk. Um, it's my job to countenance risk and frankly, to be a little bit conservative. Um, so we've had a lot of discussions about, all right, we can do grants to businesses. Can we do loans? How long can they last? What happens if things happen after December 30th, et cetera? I think I've taken a pretty conservative uh, approach, frankly, to analyzing those kinds of questions. Um, in this context, I, I don't I don't see an issue with moving people from um, you know a, a temporary housing situation either to another temporary housing situation that's better or to a permanent housing situation uh, that's definitely better. The reason being um, the the guidance says that the costs and and the the damage and the harm has to, have been incurred. And then the money spent, obligated, paid out, services completed between March 1st and December 30th. So I think there's at least some recognition. I think there's a lot of recognition that this is ongoing, that there have, have been and will continue to be stages. So first stage is just get people out of homeless encampments, for instance, or just get businesses through until May, and then we'll do the next phase. And in fact, that's what's happening with this economic development bill, where, you know, initially, they're just going to spend $70 million just to try to get businesses a bridge until the next round of funding can come along. So I, I, I feel comfortable with uh, a proposal that moves in phases in that way, you know, again, provided that the eye is on the population and the nature of the harm and the relationship to being caused by the crisis that we're in. Thank you. I just wanted to be clear about that because I really didn't think about that angle until you spoke earlier. So thank you for that. I appreciate sure. your conservatism. My pleasure. All right. We have a number of questions coming up. Um, uh, Representative Triano, then Kalaki. So I think you, you just touched on it, David, that what I'm seeing that the nexus here that connects um, the compliance with this uh, COVID relief, these COVID relief funds are that in spite of, well, in January, we heard there were 1,000 homeless Vermonters. And in March, we heard there were 2,000. So 
the nexus would be that these folks that were temporarily housed um, as a result of the COVID-19 uh, situation uh, are now, uh, now fit into this category where they would be uh, displaced as a result of this same action if we don't do something. Is that yeah, I, you know, the, the interesting thing about the housing question, it, it, again, is that it is a twofold uh, issue, and it's both economic and public health, right? I mean, whereas trying to get restaurants and, um, you know, other places back into business to preserve economic likelihood, livelihoods is mostly an economic issue, there are definite and direct health consequences to people's living arrangements, um, you know, whether they have housing, whether housing is adequate, whether housing provides sufficient ability to house in place, if that is indeed the requirement. So um, I, I think this one is, is unique in that way that it, de it definitely touches equally on both issues. And I hope that answers your question. Okay, thanks. And again, just as a reminder, this first part, and, and I, this is helpful, but this, the, the first question is on the table for us is, um, shall we carve out $23 million in the fast track? Um, and, and this is all helpful to make that decision, but I just want a reminder of that. Um, Representative Kalaki, and then Walls, and then Zot. Well, I, I'm in favor of this. Uh, I think it's, it's a great way to, to move forward. and. David, I just don't know if you've seen the DHCB proposal itself, but in the proposal intro introduction, it says to cover capital expenses necessary to secure shelter and housing for homeless households in order to mitigate COVID-19 effects and enable compliance with COVID-19 public health precautions. So it seems to me that language covers exactly what, uh, well, my read of that is it's covering what you, you say we need and maybe it could be that simple that we in, but. I, yes, thank you. I, I have, I do have it, I've, I've seen it. Um, I agree that, that uh, the language it's framed is great. That's the right purpose, this is a permissible purpose. Um, I, you know, <laughs> it, it also has to be implemented in a permissible way. So as, as Gus was suggesting, um, you know, whether they are soliciting participants, partners, or whatever, and then whatever action steps they take, that, you know, there has to be that level of faithfulness to the act and the guidance all the way through. And I mentioned that because the consequences to the state itself, if the feds conduct an audit and determine that the state or a recipient have used uh, the money for an improper purpose under the act. So uh, it's explicit that if um, that occurs, then it is the state itself, not the recipient of the money that is responsible and liable to the federal government for repayment. So I, it's incumbent upon me to tell you that. Okay, Representative Walsh. Well, I think uh, my question may have been answered by the previous two questions, uh, but let me get at it anyway. Uh, I'm in favor of fast tracking, first of all, to that question. And I'm, I'm just wondering how granular the Fed, federal, federal regulations are. And I think you may have answered this, David, that we really have to make that correct, that direct tie in to the harm because they because of the kind of temporary housing that we put them in and that we are remedying that. And do we have to be specific about numbers? Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity yet to see the most recent May 28th guidance, uh, excuse me, FAQs that put gloss on the guidance, which was issued to help interpret the act, um, but they are incredibly non-specific in most areas. There are a few places where they uh, really go out of their way to make the point, for instance, that you cannot use coronavirus funds for revenue replacement for government. 
So in the housing context, you can't use coronavirus money to help people pay their property taxes unless to avoid foreclosure or to pay their utility bills if it's to a public utility, because they do not want you to use this money for revenue replacement for governments. Uh, on the other hand, it's the guidance is very explicit about uh, being able to use the money, and let me read the quote to you, it is expenses for care for homeless populations provided to mitigate COVID-19 effects and enable compliance with COVID-19 public health precautions. So, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the small universe of, of subjects that are directly addressed by the guidance, uh, homelessness is one of them. And it's pretty clear that we do have the discretion to use the money for that population. I'm not suggesting that it's limited to the homeless population. I don't think that's the case. I think any housing related uh, need that's based on economic or health concerns is permissible as long as it meets the other requirements. Um, okay. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. It's very, I think that's very clear. Okay, Representative Zahn. Okay, hold on, Representative Sada. We've got that issue again where I can see you talking. You are unmuted. But I'm not sure what the. This happened to me yesterday as well. It was just a glitch of some sort. Do you want to write a question? Okay, he'll log back in. Um, so further, uh, further questions on the the fast track. I mean, David, do you have enough to? I mean, essentially, it looks like what we're asking for is we we are we want to appropriate twenty three million dollars to FACB for this purpose, and this is why. Is that I mean, as, as Representative Kalaki was um, looking at or what's in the VHCB document, is that sufficient for you to have something? Yes, um, it is. I, I, feel like, uh, <laughs> I feel like there's one more issue in, I want to raise for the committee just because, again, my job is to help you navigate the sort of the continuum of risk it's a very small point, but the, the guidance is, is explicit that the uh, that a state or unit of local government is able to purchase assets. Um, if assets are sold before December 30th, that money has to either be repurposed for an eligible expenditure or returned to the Treasury. Um, it is silent on what happens if you sold that asset after December 30th. So I assume that you can keep it as it suggests. Um, I, I want to, I guess the note of caution that I want to make is that um, the guidance and the FAQs speak solely in terms of states and units of local government as that is defined in the Act. Um, so I, I think that it is okay for if, if part of what we're talking about is intermediary organizations um, purchasing assets for permissible purposes uh, with COVID funding that's available to the state, I think that that is okay under the act, uh, but I cannot tell you that it is 100% okay under the act because I don't know that and nobody knows that. I think the issue is uh, complicated further by how we characterize some of the V organizations for purposes of the act. So for instance, in the economic development context, you know, I raised early on the question of whether VITA, the Vermont Economic Development Authority, is part of the state. Is it a separate entity? It's a quasi uh, governmental organization that we would in other contexts 
call an instrumentality of the state. Uh, but for purposes of the coronavirus relief funds, what does that mean? I think the argument is good that organizations like VITA, VHCB, VSAC, VHFA um, are instrumentalities and considered part of the state because they are created by statute. Um, they are funded largely through public dollars. Um, they are subject to the jurisdiction of the General Assembly and the governor through legislation. So I feel very comfortable with a proposal that would include, for instance, VHCB buying a motel or something like that. Um, I, but again, I just, I can't tell you with a 100% certainty because it's not addressed in the guidance that that authority to own assets beyond December 30th extends to non-state entities. So, so is that is that the question you're bringing up in terms of, is that a question of saying, well, if VHCB takes a proposal and gives gives the Champlain Housing Trust $3 million in order to buy a building with a series of units, mm -hmm. where does, uh, is this what you're talking about in terms of the complications, whether or not this VHC, are you saying that VHCB has to buy this unit or could they grant the money no. to these other organizations? I'm saying that if I uh, were structuring a deal and I wanted to be 100% conservative and confident about its compliance with the guidance, then I would have the state buy the building and lease it to an organization to operate it on behalf of the state. However, um, I'm not saying that that's necessary. I, again, I can't tell you that there's a right answer. All I can do is tell you that on uh, the risk continuum, the proposal, the suggestion that you just made is not 100% certain. Um, I feel like it's 95% certain. Um, and the reason I feel okay about it, again, first, the nature of VHCB. Second, um, there's another question in the guidance that, that, that says, can a state, or excuse me, says, can a county, for instance, prepay a one or two year lease for housing to basically provide temporary housing for, you know, workers who are brought in to address COVID-19 issues. And the answer in the guidance is only if prepaying that lease, a one or two year lease for that kind of housing would be something that you do in the scope of your normal operations. I think the implication there is that you can't try to end run the December 30th deadline by prepaying a two year lease um, on a building that when you normally wouldn't do that. And it's a similar uh, calculus when people are talking about, um, you know, for instance, just giving businesses loans and letting them hold on to the money for a longer period. That's a bad example. That's not a good example. Um, the bottom line is it, it matters, it seems to matter under the guidance, uh, what is a normal operational activity for a state or unit of local government when considering what an appropriate expenditure is. And I, so that gives me comfort because the state, all states regularly use intermediary organizations to implement programs whether it's nonprofits, whether it's state instrumentalities like VHCB, uh, whether it's you know agencies, departments, and divisions, or and, and things are outsourced, um, I think that is a regular practice in the course of state government. Um, that also gives me comfort. Okay, um, Representative Sock, do you want to try to chime in? Is, is it is it working yes, now? Yes, yes, excellent, okay. excellent. Yeah, I'm sure everybody's thrilled to hear from me. Um, I well, one of my questions was just addressed because I and was going to ask. Froze. Really? I can hear you. Okay. You're in and out. Uh, you're in and out. Yep. How, how about now? Now I can Good. see I'm not. Okay, there I have the green uh, indicator here. 
Uh, I was going to ask about the quasi-governmental nature of the nonprofits that we're dealing with, um, but I also wanted to ask a question about the um, the nature of nonprofits generally, because I know, as you said, there's a real fast track for businesses, and there's all as I've seen the language, there's often businesses and qualified nonprofits or eligible nonprofits. So I was curious how much leeway there is with these eligible nonprofits in terms of allocating money. And then one other piece is, I think it was, um, I think we've heard testimony to the effect that other states have already acted in these various capacities. And in terms of your continuum of risk, I guess we have sort of our potential lawsuit partners already out there that we can link with. So the more states that have acted ahead of us, I feel even com more comfortable in this continuum of risk because inevitably if there was an audit, we would probably be suffering in the same kind of scrutiny that these other states were sharing with us. Sure, uh, so to your first question, um, the, the guidance and the act itself do not limit participation uh, based on profit or nonprofit status. Um, Really, the, the limitation, as I mentioned earlier, is when you're giving money to uh, governments, and particularly state and units of local government, um, you can't do that as revenue replacement. You can't give money for things that are already budgeted for in the most recently approved budget as of March 27th. Um, so you start to really get into some thorny issues when you're talking about for instance, giving public employees some sort of compensation unless they're really working on COVID-19 stuff or, again, trying to use money to recoup unpaid tax revenue. Those are big no-nos. But in this context, um, obviously, this any, any monies that you're talking about right now were not budgeted for. Um, they're not, were not planned, were not part of any uh you know approved project in the most recent budget and um i feel like not only the work but also the administrative costs are uh could be paid with a lot of comfort through uh coronavirus funds i mean i'll, I'll say that about administrative costs again it's the same thing it's it's clear that a government can recover administrative costs for implementing public, uh, excuse me, for implementing coronavirus related programs, it, it just doesn't address the issue of whether um, you could use those funds for an intermediary. So for instance, if we were working with a bank, um, could the bank recover its corona administrative costs for helping to implement a coronavirus program? Probably but I can't give you 100% certainty because the guidance doesn't address that. Um, on the second point, uh, well, let me say one more thing about the nonprofit. So to the extent there is any limitation whatsoever, that would right now come from the state itself. So, um, but in the economic development bill of which this might become a part, nonprofits are included. Um, the second point you've made, uh, do we take comfort from other states of using similar mechanisms? Probably, uh, to the extent that the more states that do it, the maybe the more acceptable or favorably treasury would look upon it. But do remember that audits are uh, individual to states as our liabilities. So if we spend $3 million, Treasury audits Vermont and determines the expense was not permissible under the act, then Vermont alone is on the hook for $3 million. But I guess that should be one more piece of your risk calculus. And that is, you know, you're also taking uh, a calculated risk about whether you get audited and if you do what Treasury determines and depending on what they determine, whether you have to pay money back. And it could be the case that you're willing to take that risk because you're willing to spend the money anyway. So try it with the coronavirus funds and if it doesn't work, you know, you, you pay treasury back in three years. I, I'm not suggesting that that's the, uh, an issue in this particular context, but it, it has been suggested in others. In the case, um, 
David, in the in the case though, it, 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 again, here's the question: we're 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 about to allocate money to, um, or so to propose to allocate money to to a number of different places. Uh, mm -hmm. But today, you know, this 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 hour will 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 deal with um, as an example this twenty three million dollars to VHCB. Now, as far as process goes, we're allocating this money for them to use it in a way that's been deemed legal by many other people other than us or you or whomever if that money is then allocated to them through the the senate process it comes back to us um and it, and it comes through us goes to appropriations goes to the government i mean there's still many steps along the way that's going to maybe there's more of a clarification of what the risk calculus is but in the end the use of that money doesn't stop here. I mean, VHCB might get a memo or, or AHS might get a memo or someone else might get a Department of Labor or, or ACCD might get a memo in three months that says you can or can't do this and actions will be made. I, I'm just... Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just... It puts us in a bind because, of course, you know, we want to wring our hands over what the I want to wring my hands over what the risk calculus is. But by the same token, this is an extraordinary circumstance and we're trying to at least move what we can. Yeah. Move, so, so, without mean, being irresponsible. Look, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an attorney, right? And yours. And so it's, it's my job to be conservative and tell you the risk. But I, I don't want to leave anybody. Um, with the impression that I feel uncomfortable with the proposal as I've seen it from the ACB, because I don't, I feel because it directs, addresses public health and economic needs due to homelessness and other risks because of the crisis, I feel very comfortable with it. I just, my job to tell you whether or not I <laughs> am certain something is or is not, and you know, that's what I do. I feel good about this one. If you came to me and said, uh, we're going to keep $5 million just in case we need it in March, I tell you, you can't do that. But that's not what you're doing here. <laughs> right. So, um, and David, are you still scheduled to be at, uh, to leave us at 2.30? I am, uh, but I don't have to. They can wait. Um, so, so committee, I just want to kind of call the question, first of all, on the fast track. Um, is it okay to, um, I guess, is it okay to ask David to create some language as, as obviously as quickly as possible, but just also as, I mean, it sounds like it's a relatively simple thing, but, but do we agree with the concept of carving on million dollars from the tier one allocation that we've received to give to, to this crisis to this fast track um, bill that's going to be taken up in the Senate and which co should come back to us by the end of net by the middle to end of next week if you want to use that little participant hand you know you, you want to put your hands you do it by the show of hands on the participant All right, so I'm seeing um, yeses. Um, I'm going to, man, I don't have that button to take down all the hands. So if you, I'll, I'll lower your hands by yourself. So, so is there, it looked like everybody was saying yes, um, representative. Um, so was there anybody opposed? No. All right, so David, if there is a way for you to write something as simple as what we've talked about, something that can be utilized as a um, an amendment that we can share the language with the Senate so that they can use it next week um, with our kind of our good housekeeping seal of approval, I guess is the best level of, of approval we can give it right now. And then we'll see it again next week. All right, mm -hmm. I will uh, turn it around and I will share it with you. Okay, thank you. Um, all of this is very good 
foundational work for the rest of the story. Um, we have we have requests that are both um, capital and service requests, and the difficulty is in the service side of things. So I wanted to hold off on that for the time being, but I do not want to ignore the fact that even if there is the capital purchases that are being proposed over the next couple of months, that so we don't lose sight of the fact that those services, as we heard about on um, yesterday, are, are really necessary for the financial viability of, those, of these projects ongoing. Um, I invited uh, someone who hasn't testified in our committee this year, Michael Monty from Champlain Housing Trust to join us. Um, along with the stuff that we've been talking about, we, there was one category about renovating uh, existing shelters. Now, while the focus has been on one hand of wouldn't it be great to get everybody out of shelters, um, I think the idea is in reality, can, wouldn't it be great if we can get most people out of shelters? So there's always gonna, I think, I think it's hard to say that we will never need shelters, but there's been discussion. It's been a little bit quiet about um, putting money aside from this for shelter renovation and making them healthier and safer. And um, I wanted to, uh, the proposal that VHCB sent um, this morning to us, increase that number from from a lower number to ten million dollars um, which at this point in time is uh, fits into our allocation to a degree um, and I just wanted Michael to comment on that and then just as a just what I have on my list here after I talk to Michael um, and anyone else who wants to chime in on the shelter issue I do want to go to Commissioner Hanford because the other quasi new conversation is about foreclosure. Um, Commissioner Hanford has talked about it, but we have not seen any kind of, um, we haven't had more than a general conversation about that. So just in terms of being on deck, um, Commissioner Hanford, you're on, you're on deck. Um, so Michael, thank you for joining us and welcome to the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Thank you very much, Chairman, and I appreciate the time. Um, Chris Donnelly and I have been in regular conversation of the work that the legislature has been doing. And um, I, I honor your the service and the work that you've been doing in this context, especially. Um, so we're engaged very much in the homeless uh, arena. We work very closely with the homeless service providers. I've been meeting regularly over the last few months on a almost daily, sometimes three times a week basis. Uh, coordinating sort of our response during COVID. Uh, part of what has happened is Harbor Place has been stood up as a isolation and quarantine facility. As you know, Harbor Place was a fairly good um, um, arrangement between us and the state of Vermont in terms of providing uh, short-term care to folks who are homeless at a fairly low, lower cost with better results. And we continue to hope that that facility comes back and does that. But in our discussions with the homeless folks over the last few um, few months, uh, we've sort of realized that, in fact, many of the people who might be in shelters and, and motels right now are actually in those locations because they're not able to be managed well within the existing homeless shelter structure. So we've had some discussions internally and certain um, uh, as, a, as a sort of as a community. Uh, and also we've had very specific discussions with the uh, steps from the domestic of the, uh, and domestic violence. And, that particular group is uh, works with a group of folks who are homeless who will be homeless no matter how uh, hard we uh, change or try, meaning uh, victims of domestic violence become homeless instantaneously uh, often enough and find themselves in those conditions. And there's not an economic reason uh, in the first step, meaning it's not a loss of jobs or, or something else like that it, uh, or chronic homelessness. And so a lot of the folks in the hotel motels right now and a lot of folks who come to a harbor place, in fact, are victims of domestic violence. And one of the things that we would uh, like to do working with them and part of the uh, what will respond if funds are available is to create a better shelter uh, so that people can, in fact, be safer uh, and so that they can actually manage more people than they are right now in the current system. And so that, in fact, if something like show, um, sheltering in place is the health 
directive um, because of another pandemic or this pandemic as it extends in time, then uh, we will have something that in fact will really meet the needs of folks who are victims of violence as well as reduce sort of the impact and cost uh, to the state of Vermont uh, to put people up in motels scattered throughout Chittenden County. Um, and in conversations again with other homeless vote providers, you know, we have sort of uh, looked at um, $5 million or sort of a dollar amount that, that will work in terms of knowing that we could impact um, homeless um, shelters as they are now. Uh, again, Steph's working with COTS, working with a new place who are the principal homeless providers in Chittenden County. And, and our, our thought is, is that uh, and around the rest of the state of Vermont, because we just basically coordinate with the continuum of care here uh, in Chittenden County. Um, but that, in fact, that is probably true in other places. Um, we know, and uh, those organizations know that they need to um, uh, get these funds going and use them in a fairly short period of time. And we are ready to do that. And so, so are those other groups. So I would urge uh, the committee to keep, keep an eye on that opportunity. I know VACB has been very clear in their support in terms of doing something like this. Uh, and this essentially, if we could, uh, Think of it as resiliency, as we did with Irene. This is really the same thing. As next time this happens, or as this is happening now, uh, we have something much better in place to ensure that people are safe and healthy. And so the $5 million number you had is a specific to Chittenden County. Just what you're, what just with the folks that you work with. Yeah. So uh, you know, of, of, of the of the couple of thousand in the state, uh, four to four four hundred plus households are in Chittenden County, and um, you know, it's a fairly large number that can't be managed in smaller settings and needs to be, you know, have this fairly sophisticated and larger system to respond to. But yes, that is just Chittenden County. Um. Representative Hango. Sorry, trying to unmute myself. Um, just hearing about Chittenden County leads me to um, wonder. I know there are some specific pro proposals um, that Rutland County and Franklin County have, and I'm wondering if this is the, the arena that we need to talk about those, or at least um, allowing the allocation of money to specific regions. I know Representative Kalaki brought this up a few days ago, and um, I was kind of at that time more in favor of a statewide allocation and then letting the um, agencies, the partners who really knew where the needs were divide up, but I guess I didn't realize that there are some fairly robust plans already in the making if they can get funding. So is this the conversation to talk about regional funding? Um, well, I, I'm going to, I'm going to pass that to Gus if, if he's available because my experience with uh, VHCB in particular as this kind of umbrella organization that doesn't do the funding, right? I mean, traditionally VHCB manages a lot of money and they, they manage it up, but they're not the ones who are primary funders. But, um, but they, if you take a look at their list of projects, they are they, universal across the state of Vermont. They, man, you know, really one of the, one of their, things is to make sure that every corner of Vermont is, is um, their needs are addressed. But I'll punt that to, to Gus and have him address that for you, Lisa. Um, so thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I will just say that um, over the years that I've worked at the board and sometimes so long ago that the current operators would not know it, we have funded pretty much every shelter in the state. So that's among the work we've done. We've worked with Spectrum in Burlington. We've worked with the uh, Bennington Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, we've worked with Josh Davis in Brattleboro. So uh, as, our, as the proposal that Jen sent uh, to staff and is posted today indicates, as Michael just indicated, we've identified a clear need of $5 million in one part of the state. Um, we think that those needs probably are representative 
around the state to help other shelters. We know the one in Barrie is not in its current condition, CDC compliant. That's part of why it was completely emptied out. Um, and we would be happy to do the work um, to do an assessment of how much need there is all over the state with the shelter providers. Uh, you know, they are usually coming to us once every five to 10 years. We've done a fair amount of work though with the John Graham shelter in recent years in, in Addison County. Uh, so that we don't, we don't hear from them regularly, but we'd be happy to take this on if you asked us to uh, and make funds available to the whole state and certainly get back to the committee in a few weeks um, as quickly as we can about what others around the state see as their short term to be accomplished by December 30th needs to become CDC compliant. But if the need in Chittenden County is $5 million, uh, we certainly think that it's likely, but we don't know it, uh, that we would need double that amount to serve the whole state. And, and Gus, the following up on kind of not quite the regionalism but also we've we've talked you've testified about about identifying the different groups and one of, of of people who are currently homeless and one of them is the families with children and regardless of where they are across the state um do you need legislative direction to make those things a priority or is that something that is a uh, uh, considered a normal course of business with your partners? Um, I think it's a normal course of business. Um, obviously, if you put something in writing that says, I think our focus with both the funds you've just talked about, fast tracking and assisting shelters will be in two directions. And one will be to house families with children because we know that the trauma that uh, children being homeless the results of that trauma for children who are homeless. And the second group will be the individuals who have significant needs for supportive housing and wraparound services, many of whom probably need clinical needs that will not dissipate uh, in the next six to 12 months. They're gonna need what we call permanent supportive housing in order to maintain their housing. So I think those are the groups that um, probably ought to be at the top of anybody's list for permanent housing. I think other programs um, are, you know, there are some people out there who can resolve on themselves or with a little bit of help from the rental assistance program that uh, Josh's agency has put forth uh, with several months rent going to be able to, and security deposit going to be able to get back into the housing market because there are homeless people who actually do have in, income from employment right now. Um, so I think there's a variety of solutions, but we certainly would be focused on those two groups. And so, yes, uh, families with children would be uh, at the top of anybody's list. And some of those families with children might be in the category that Tony was talking about yesterday that might be, you know, very short term, might, might just need a leg up. And some of them may need, again, as we mentioned, more services than more, more uh, the permanent services than, than just that. Um, so committee, that's something that is um, when we start to allocate funds again, thinking in terms of tier one, tier two, um, again, tier one is going to be something that is we think is needs to get out the door as soon as possible. And tier two is is something that is either a continuation of those priorities. I mean, I, I have a hard time saying that one of these items that we've talked about over the last weeks is less important than others um, or to assign them priorities, but it may, may well be that we say, well, okay, we can, we can put out X percentage of this amount of money to this, you know, to this purpose. And then in tier two, we might go and here's $4 million more or what have you. So just keep that in mind as well as we, as we start thinking about how to um, allocate the funding. Um, Michael, do you have anything? I want to be conscious of your time. I know that you're on a limited schedule. Um, I appreciate that. No, I just I appreciate the committee's uh, support. Uh, you know, we are um, we we appreciate the difficulty of moving quickly. We are trying to move quickly and be ready. Uh, so as soon as you make the funds available, we'll work with all the organizations that we work with to put it to good use. And I think you'll see a good response from around the state in terms of responding to this. And again, 
it's a direct response to COVID as much as it's anything else. And so uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate right. it. And just to be clear, this is to take situations that have tended to be over. Uh, I mean, I've, we visited, um, or I know I have, I, I, I've visited the Seminary Street building for Good Good Samaritan Haven. I'm not sure, um, Tommy, if, if you've been there, but it, 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 doesn't meet the CDC purposes um, for as much work as it does. I mean, so I'm assuming that the money that would be allocated under those circumstances would be, um, certainly would be to um, make them healthy or to keep them healthy, um, first and foremost, whether it's social distancing, whether it's basic, um, the, or the basic layout even of, of those, of those um, facilities. That's basic. That's the essential idea here: is to sort of know that the shelter system that we have now can, in fact, manage the the number of homeless people we have better. Uh, a lot of the shelters were emptied, uh, and uh, that's a lot of the folks who are in the motel system now. And when they're in the shelters, they get higher levels of services, and they can be placed in regular housing to coordinated care. And that's more difficult to do when they're scattered about in different motels and different locations all across the state. So it really will strengthen the system of uh, serving homelessness and uh, get people into permanent housing a lot faster. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. And Gus, yep. Yeah. Gus. Mr. Chairman, this may be beyond what you can do with the fast tracking, but to the extent that what we're trying to do is get work done by December 30th, if you put anything, it can do anything more than 23 million in the fast tracking for this population that will just get the ball rolling, get people planning, get them to get in touch with contractors because they know something may be possible down the road. Um, so I don't know if you have that capacity today, but if you did, I would, at some amount, I would encourage you to, to, to add that in. And, no, thank you for that. I mean, I think we're, this fast track was a new addition to the tier one, tier two. Um, concept that I've worked with for all the 24 hours. And so, um, so the idea is if we can get this language out right now, you know, we're talking about a deadline of next Wednesday for the, for the next, for the tier one language. So it's all going to happen pretty, pretty quickly um, right on top of the other one. So um, Tony, you had, Tony Grout, you had your hand up. I just thought that I would take a moment. This is Tony back from Capstone Community Action. It's just like in on the street building. Um, part of our plan is that we would have a hub, which would be a new uh, CDC compliant shelter that would also pull together our overflow guests. So currently we, in the wintertime, we spread out over three locations. And um, as it was stated, it's really difficult to engage everyone and get them into the system when they're in three different locations only um, for the evening hours. So um, our plan for this hub is not only to get all of our currently homeless uh, folks kind of in the same area, but to provide um, micro apartments on the second floor for those folks who need to build uh, rental references or who might be willing to take that next step, but still are going to need a lot of the support from the uh, shelter staff that they have really come to count on and uh, trust in their world. So um, I can't say enough how much the shelter systems, I think throughout the state really do need to be um, prioritized, not necessarily just to grow bigger shelters, but better spaces, more trauma-informed um, spaces that can really help folks move on, not just um, get a dry, warm night to sleep in. So thank you guys for taking a look at that. Um, yep, thank you for, for that. Um, all right, I'm gonna go right over to, I'm sorry if I feel like I'm speeding here. I am having an afternoon coffee and um, we have so much to cover. Josh, um, Commissioner Hanford. Um, Commissioner Hanford is probably on his third or fourth stop of the day. Um, he has language that was shared in your mailbox and is on our page that has to do with uh, the, um, 
a foreclosure proposal um, and a series of money. Again, we have we've only heard about it. We haven't considered it. I or I thought 24 hours ago that this would be more of a commerce um, concept because of their connection directly with banking. Um, but that seems to be shifting. Uh, the potential responsibility seems to be shifting back to to us as a housing committee. So, Josh. Um, help us untie this knot a little bit and tell us what you're thinking, please. Sure, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, well, you got me out of one of those because I was supposed to be in House Commerce right now when they were gonna take this up, um, but it's been kicked back over to you guys. So um, th this is really a uh, ultimately a foreclosure prevention, but it's really mortgage assistance is what's, what's going on here. You know, as you know, Vermont has one of the highest home ownership rates in the country and probably one of the highest low income homeowner rates in, in, the, in the country. Um, most banks, certainly from all Vermont banks that originate mortgage and credit unions, um, everyone's in sort of forbearance right now. Um, that's not exactly true with some of the national sort of um, mortgage lenders out there. They haven't universally um, offered that. Um, we've had a, a, a number of meetings with sort of a coalition of folks that um, are, are, you know, work in this arena. Um, we've been meeting a few times to understand what, what the need is, how a program like this could work, who, who potentially could administer it. Um, and it's a pretty basic concept. We know that uh, some of these uh, Vermont uh, banks, the three month forbearance is going to be ending um, like this month. Um, but more likely, there's going to be more sort of concern come uh, July, August, September, as these uh, temporary forbearance uh, come off and folks are not going to have their income restored enough to either um, pay that that's often added to the end of their their loan terms in, in many cases but others they're expected to pay that sort of three month uh forbearance um right at, at one time in a lump sum that's going to be difficult um with folks still having reduced incomes and so this would be a program that helps uh, address that need you know once again would be a needs-based um we've worked with uh legal aid um uh, VHFA, uh, the Credit Union Association, the Bankers Association, and a number of other folks to talk about what the elements of the program would be. It, once again, it could be flexible as far as, you know, is it one month, two months? What we landed on is in order for this six million to go very far and help very, uh, enough people, we can't stretch it more than six months. The money would run out really fast. So that's been a cap we've all agreed on. Um, as far as uh, income eligibility, you know, what AMI, uh, area median income level are we going up to? You know, that, that's an open question. Um, you know, folks that are at 100%, 120% AMI may be just in, in, in just as much need of some uh, mortgage assistance um, as someone, you know, that's 60, 80% AMI. So that's an open question, but we've generally agreed on the areas that um, are, are uh, there's a basic understanding for how this would work. Um, this is cash benefits, similar, similar to the rental assistance, rental rearage, but for, for folks that have mortgages to keep them from entering a foreclosure process down the road due to loss of income directly related to COVID. Um, the $6 million number may not nearly be enough. Um, it might be exactly right. We're struggling with trying to find what the exact amount of need here is. And just like the other two programs that the um, administration proposed, the, the 42 million for rental assistance and 8 million for the, the rehab to, to rehouse homeless, we suggest there be a relief valve in here to move um, funding among the three different programs as the exact need plays out. No one's, you know, wants to uh, get this wrong it, just because we needed to settle on an exact number. It's about serving the, the real need out there um, and think it's smart to allow some sort of adjustment among these three programs come 
the end of August, September, if their need seems to be higher in one area and lower in another. Um, and with the general sort of nature of the legislation that, that's being put together to, to use this Corona relief money, you know, keeping it flexible and open um, is the same uh, process we've laid out here. But with the framework behind the scenes that uh, you know stakeholders have worked out that this is the that generally how the program is going to work. Here's the 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 maximum you know number of months, the maximum household income. All those sort of would be developed um, and put into the program administration. But it doesn't need to be in the in the language at that detail to keep things moving. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions that, that come up from that quick overview. I know uh, Wendy Morgan's also on, on, on here and she's been involved in this since the beginning. Um, so yeah, I'll just see what, what questions come up. So we do have a couple of questions. I'll start though with, um, this is residential, correct? Correct, residential only. And- Vermont will, style, obviously, yeah. Yep, yeah. um, right, not so not second, not not second home mortgages, but but, but homestead, basically homestead mortgages. Um, and the other thing that popped into my head was um, just a reminder that, you know, with this idea, the way that the General Assembly is, is, is taking the look right now in terms of how to handle these funds, we're talking about um, tier one, tier two, you know, and almost seeing like saying, okay, well, maybe, maybe from March one till, you know, October one is one or till, August or September, when we come back, you know, we, we, we take a chunk of money now and put it into tier one. So maybe it's not $42 million. Uh, maybe it's a lesser amount, maybe it's a greater amount, but just we're, I mean, that's part of our process going forward in the next few days is, is like anticipating that goes against a little bit of what we've heard may happen with, you know, we may run into some friction about how we're going to, how we're supposed to spend all this money and whether or not there's actually going to be a tier two. So I just want to keep that in mind as we're, as we're talking about this as well. Right. Um, so I have, I have um, representative Triano and then Kalaki, I thought, and, and representative Hango, is your hand up or down? No. Okay. Thank you. So representative Triano. Thank you. Uh, I guess, for the sake of not sounding oversimplistic, why aren't we approaching banks and asking them to extend mortgages out by three months for these three months of missed payments, Josh? Oh, oh, they are already extended. You know, there's no foreclosures part happening right now. All the Vermont banks and credit unions have already given, you know, up to, uh, in some cases, six months. And if they have a, um, a GSA backed loan, it's up to a year. But they can't wipe away, you know, the payments due. Um, well, when I'm those four, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting taking the three months that have been missed and putting them on the at tail end of the mortgage to extend the mortgage out by three months. To that, that's happening in some cases for sure. No, not universally with, um, you know, uh, mortgages that don't have any sort of. Um, you know, backing behind them. Some of them are, need that payment. They need, they need their funds rolling in to keep their borrowing happening. And the reality is folks coming off of that are still going to, many folks are still going to have reduced incomes. So just because it was added to the three months at the end of their, you know, 20 year mortgage, um, they're going to have trouble paying the next three as soon as they come off that, you know, and you get into fall, you got to fill up the oil tank and, there's going to be, and this is not, you know, at a mere $2,000 assistance, this is only able to serve 3,000 homeowners. We have many, many low-income homeowners that um, even coming off a of forbearance period are going to be struggling to pay their bills. And, and you know, in the, the um, discussion that uh, Chairman Stevens just mentioned about how much we allocate here and there, um, you know, I, I'm just trying to, to express that between the rental assistance and mortgage assistance that these dollars are relatively low cost per individual in need, need based compared to what the alternative is. If we can't stop a situation at this level, you see what the costs are to build new housing for someone that's homeless. This, this, this is, um, money well spent to keep people housed and prevent a disruption 
that has lasting impacts and much higher budget implications for us and society in general. So, okay, thank you. All right, Representative Klecky. Thank you, Ed, and Josh, this is a really interesting uh, addition to this. So thank you and your team for coming up with this. Um, I, 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 I like the, well, I think you called it a valve to kind of be able to make sure what we're doing this right over the next couple of months. But I, I worry a little bit about uh, not, not the um, rental arrears program or this, this new thing, because that's keeping people housed, but the other $8 million in the administration proposal of the, um, the, the loans to help people rehab derelict housing to move people in. And I, I would not want that to get lost in this because that's a real effective tool for us to address this homelessness issue. So um, that's, it's, it, I know we're not there yet to figure out this valve thing, but I think those are separate tracks for me. That this goes with rental arrears and the other is about homelessness. I, I appreciate that. I think the one place that it does get mixed, um, there, there's been some discussions around, you know, say we are able to rehab uh, a, a home that exists um, and we can match up first, la first, last security deposit and three months of rental assistance to house a homeless family in one of those rehab units. And so they're working together in that way, as I envision it. But if we get to, you know, November and there is, it's clear that we're not going to rehab those other 20 homes that are in the pipeline that have money, you know, dedicated to them, but no one started that work and the money hasn't been obligated. Well, we could quickly provide additional rental assistance to families in need, maybe coming out of homelessness that could use another three month of rental assistance to really stabilize their situation, you know, as a bridge Okay. before permanent rental assistance gets there and all that. So that's how I think it does. But okay. what I'm more worried about is this was always supposed to be in our phase two proposal, which was supposed to already be discussed this week when we laid out the other one two weeks ago, because the, the mortgage assistance really is a, you know, August, September, October need and the rental assistance is now but seeing that the money might run out, the, you know, if, if the legislature is going to break, it, it became apparent that we needed to throw this in the mix and have people know that there's already draft legislation and ready to go now in case we can roll it in um, with the package. Because also I think we, we leave with the housing assistance package to address Corona. And if there's no mention of how we're going to keep homeowners, which the you know highest number of low income people are homeowners in Vermont. There's going to be some concern about where was our head, what were we thinking, and so um, uh, I think it's important to talk about it now. All right, thank you, appreciate it. The other thing uh, which is making this 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 game, if you will, this this trying to understand where to put the money to is that if we're if we make things stereotypical and say most people who are unemployed are probably the ones at risk for eviction and 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 foreclosure, you know, they are receiving the extra six hundred dollars a week for the time being, which if nothing else changes, ends at the end of July. Right. Which means that probably the first if they're using their payments, I mean, S three thirty three was very clear. This is not about rental vacation. You know, this is not about foreclosure vacation, about, you know, the, the stuff that we did in S-333. And, um, but I, I think that we might begin to see if this $600 a week or if unemployment is not extended in a way that allows people to, to continue to bridge, bridge over through the pandemic, um, that's when we're going to begin to see uh, more of each of these. Right. Um, and this, this language, we are keeping very clean about this was for mortgage assistance, money out. There's also a technical assistance and counseling piece that helps prevent foreclosures, too. We know those programs are successful. The home ownership centers run those, others. And, you know, our thinking is that we have continuing tranches of CDBG Corona relief money coming in. We got another $2 million we need to apply for in, a, in another month that we would consider dedicating some of that for the counseling 
assistance side and funnel it, you know, through those organizations to do that and not muddy the waters with this, um, with the service side, just keep this peer cash to help people pay their mortgage. So they don't go down the foreclosure path. And we would have other assistance that would come through the CDBG federal funds to help with the counseling, um, and, and, uh, work that needs to go along with this. So again, Josh, is this, I, I haven't looked at the language, so I'm, I'm, if it's not, co if, if it's covered in there, I apologize, but a mortgage assistance program or a foreclosure prevention program is going to be run by whom? Well, it, it would be run by a, a statewide entity that is um, equipped to do this, that has expertise in here. I think that the group that has chatted a few times ha have um, sort of thought that VHFA is the most appropriate entity. Um, but it doesn't spell that out in here. I think that's one of the, the pieces in, in uh, the proposals that we have that before this all passes, if the legislature is comfortable either outright naming the groups that we think are the best administrators or providing language that, you know, suggest that this entity that meets these criteria, which really only leaves a few choices, it certainly would save us time from having to do an ANOFA and a competitive grant selection process. So NOFA, NOFA means what? Notice of funding availability. Okay. Cause up here, that's a Northeast organic farmer. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, you know, an RFP is to do, do a contract. We backed away from the contract idea because it will take longer from our contracting with the state caps and everything that we've put in place for good reason to prevent contracts from going bad. A lot of it projects, but looking at the length and time and effort, we would have to do a competitive grant to a NOFA or name an entity either directly or through the typical language that you see sometimes which sort of narrows who could be eligible to, to you know, one party in the state to, to speed this thing. Okay. So we have to figure out, I mean, we have to take some, I, not boilerplate language, but we have to take some specific boilerplate language and make it work if we were to do that. Um, which leads me, well, thank you for this, Josh. I think this is, um, this is helpful. Um, it's different than the rental assistance program. Obviously it would be a different management system um, because VHFA is as close to a bank as we get for a quasi governmental agency. Um, I see that um, Richard Williams is here also. And the question that came up and I didn't get an answer yet is, is the question of whether or not the Vermont State Housing Authority has been mentioned in the same terms that Josh just mentioned. Like if you, you know, we could craft something that basically says this is all about Vermont State Housing Authority. But Richard, you sent some information that I didn't get clarification yet that said that the, v, the Vermont State Housing Authority does not receive state funds. And I'm just curious to know whether you've heard anything from your attorneys or whether or not um, any of the, uh, I see, well, Josh, you're here. I think that would that you would probably be the person who may know. If we crafted language that tried to cut this process down and said, we want to name the Vermont State Housing Authority as the holder of the rental assistance money, um, would they even be able to accept that money? And Richard, did you hear, have you heard? I have uh, from my own attorney, uh, and uh, just looking for the email so I could actually quote from it. Uh, Richard, before we find that, I think we have two questions here, two paths. You know, one is their name directly as as the entity and directly appropriated the funds, and that's that's the problem I think Richard's facing. But if you say, like it's designed now, it's appropriated to us, and we are to um, find an administrator, which is a statewide entity that distributes housing vouchers across the state, et cetera, et cetera, and then we grant it to them, granting to State Housing Authority is not a problem. We've granted projects to them before. It's directly appropriating to them without going through us that I think is the, the potential problem. Is that the workaround we have for the state-based vouchers? 
Uh, with the state-based vouchers, we actually contract with uh, Agency of Human Services through DCF and, and such. Uh, so we're administering a contract. They actually went out for a, you know, a contract through an RFP. We responded to that. But our lawyers basically says if the, uh, you know, if, if the legislature designates us, uh, he, he does not see a problem, you know. Basically, what it says is we. That's can't not what he it. said. He said something a lot wordier than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, they, you know how I'm sorry. I was going to say you know they get paid by the word, but you know I can't. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair. Uh, no, but basically, you know, if the legislature uh, designates Vermont State Housing Authority, he does not see a problem uh, with that. Basically, what he said the language is we can't go and demand an appropriation from the Vermont legislature. Uh, it's basically what that leg, uh, what that language is in our uh, statute is for. So, okay, well, so that yeah, it looks like we could take the money directly. Uh, you know, I still have you know some concerns about rulemaking, uh, and I'm you know, um, I, if we have to go through a rulemaking process on this, that again is going to delay getting that money out the door. So I don't know if there's something you can do legislatively there as well. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons Wendy Morgan's on here today too. Uh, you know, that's why I, I, in the, uh, in Angela, you know, put a lot of detail in that proposal was to try to get as much as they could into the legislation, therefore not necessarily needing to go through a rulemaking process or emergency rulemaking process. Okay. Um, it's 3.05. We didn't start till 1.30. Are people, is the committee okay to be online for another 25 minutes? Okay. Um, and Ron, is that okay with you? Or do you need to be anyplace else, Ron? Okay. Thank you. Um, all right, well, that's off the checklist or that's just something to check more on from, um, I, I need to reread the VLA, VLA proposal um, a little bit more closely, but that's good to hear that there's two different options. Um, that are both viable. I, I mean, I think I'm more used to hearing the solution that Commissioner Hanford has proposed just because that's the way our state government works. But I'd be interested in investigating uh, what, what Richard just mentioned to us. Um, Could I also make one more comment? Uh, please do. Yeah. Uh, I also think I might have left uh, Representative uh, Kalaki. Uh, I think I testified on Tuesday. I, th I think you asked me the, the question, Representative, if I supported the Vermont Legal Aid and uh, Apartment Owners uh, proposal and I may have not I may have left it in your impression that I didn't and that was not my intent uh what basically I was trying to leave the door open and say we're going to respond to whatever is available and if you know uh we have worked closely with legal aid and the apartment owners things on the on the proposal we feel uh pretty comfortable with the, the way it's laid out uh but if the uh you know if the ACCD came out with an RP or a NOFA or whatever, uh, we'd still be, we would apply for that and we'd probably be presenting pretty similar uh, proposal as to what you have seen uh, or maybe haven't seen uh, illegal aid proposal and apartment owners thing. So hopefully I didn't confuse the issue when I testified. So, um... In the remaining time, I want to cover two more things. And Commissioner Hanford, I want to, um, well, actually, I want to give you a chance to breathe for a little bit and then um, ask the committee, just in general, we've talked a lot and I've made mention to keep it going, the conversation around H739, which is the rental registry. Um, the idea that um, the only immediate appropriation in the rental registry bill is to the um, Department of Housing and Community Development to work with the uh, Agency of Digital Services to develop the database. 
based on the tax information that's, a, that's publicly available, whether it's part of the new rental rebate system or the old tax situation. And then because the way that the bill was constructed was that, um, was that there would be a fee structure that would be involved with it, but that would not go into effect until another date certain. And in the, in the case of the bill, it was January 1 of 2021 if the bill passed this year. And so I just wanna put it out to the committee. Um, it, you know, we've had a lot of conversation on it. We've heard, we've heard a lot of testimony from different people that said that the, the registry would have been helpful. It would not have been something that helped, that would have eradicated or made easier in some respects, the, the placement of homeless individuals, but it may have um, helped people. And, and I mean, I think we've, uh, I think we've heard from different different folks about that. And I just want to kind of put that on the table as kind of a checklist. Is this something that we want to include in tier one? It's it's right now, it's an estimated $600,000 based on the information that we received from, it's, well, Wendy, you're saying four, but there's also another 200,000 in there from other resources that I'm just saying 600 because it's, um, because those resources may not be directly available um, at this time, but it was, um, but, the, and there was also once upon a time, there was another million, just under a million dollars mm -hmm. to stand up the Department of Public Safety. I hesitate to, um, to, to recommend that at this time, but I'm just curious, do we want to continue the conversation of including the rental registry as part of the converse, as part of this conversation that it would be, um, it would it would be done in, in order to help expedite everything that we've been talking about. And I think we can make the argument that it's COVID related. Um, Representative Sott, we've got that voice thing going on again. Do you want to text a question on the chat box? Um, okay, uh, Representative Zas was saying that he does not support including it. I've not been persuaded by the testimony. Uh, Representative Hango. Um, rental registry, I am not a fan. I do not really see the connection between the COVID crisis and a rental registry. And I'm not anxious to spend extra money on computer systems or that type of um, paperwork gathering at this point in time. I believe we need to help people with real needs, such as rental assistance in the form of arrearages and um, um, mortgage foreclosure preventions, things like that. I, I really am not interested in spending money on administrative functions at this point in time. Thank you. Representative Kalanke. Uh, yesterday when we were talking, I like what uh, Representative Hango said about, let's make a list of all the things we've been discussing. And I think that we, we made a lot of progress today. So thank you, Chair, for kind of organizing this. And I, I would keep it on the list. And I might say that it may be a lower priority when we see what resources we have. Um, but until we really have that list of everything that we've been discussing uh, and what's left with the kind of allocations we want to move forward with, so I would include it for now. I'd probably be a lower priority for me, depending on the needs. But I, I think it's a good way to get the holistic list together um, on when Tuesday, I guess, when we next meet uh, on this to see what other issues we want to address or that we haven't addressed yet. So that's where I am. All right. Any further comments on, on 739 right now? All right, seeing none. Um, oh, Representative Howard, you can mute, unmute. Sorry about that. Um, I agree. I don't. I don't think it should be a top priority, but um, I think that it's an opportunity now to 
to uh, have a, a, a list of um, um, uh, people who are renting uh, for a future. Um, it seems to be that the state uh, is always like behind. Uh, we all, we, we, I mean, obviously with the unemployment insurance issue, we had a 30 year old um, computer system. Um, so I agree it's important to take care of the absolute needs first, but I think it also is important to, to consider the, um, the registry. Thank you. Thank you. And, and just a reminder that the registry is not just for the sake of having the list, it is also um, the basis for having the rental housing safety uh, portion of H739. And considering that we're talking about giving money uh, to people who are having people take a risk in, in, in taking apartments offline that are currently unsafe, um, having a rental housing safety uh, function in the state, it might be the right time to do that. Um, Representative Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, um, that um, really ties into what I was thinking about in terms of um, we keep talking about this money for landlords to rehab buildings that are not very safe. I think it's a generally good idea, and I really also very worry about public funds going to private landlords, um, particularly when there's just such a small amount of years to keep it at affordability. And so I have some real concerns about that and also see that we're in a, a crisis time and so we're looking at all the options. And so in that, I really think about the rental registry as investing in the properties overall and investing in the renters and by having the the access of knowledge of where folks are that we will have more um it'll be easier for us to identify these potential landlords um, who who could in the future also increase their safety of their properties and increase in moving their properties back online so i think it's a I think it's really important that we look at, at housing safety as we're looking at housing for public health safety and having uh, having this bill and that connection. I, I just I, th I think it's very valuable. I also think that we need to, to look at all of our priorities, as other representatives have said, so that we can make um, it's a it's a it's a puzzle as it always is. Um, and and I think looking at the list is, is important and that to me, this seems very, very tight in as we're looking at rental housing and moving people into safe housing for, for all the reasons that we need to do that. Thank you. Um, all right, uh, Commissioner Hanford, back to you. Um, the enhanced VHIP program. Um, we received some guidance from David Hall uh, or through the Treasury FAQs, which are making it into an, a differently interesting um, question. And Wendy, I'm sorry, before, Josh, before I go further, Wendy, I hear see your name up. Are you here on VHIP or on? I'm on anything, so why don't you put me after you're done with Josh? On anything? Well, no, I have a Do couple we get to of comments on a couple of things. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, and Josh, so I, I guess, Josh, I just want you to be able to address the fact that, the, you know, some of the, some of the readings of the Treasury uh, guidance, which, of course, still fall somewhat short of regulations and laws, um, say that the, uh, as applied to the VHIP program, it's, it, it, it puts a, an imbalance between what's a forgivable loan and what's a grant. And the notion being that a forgivable loan, the concept of a forgivable loan is to say, here's this money, we're loaning it to you at 0% or 1% or whatever that is. And if you reach these benchmarks, it will become a grant. And what these uh, the Treasury is saying is that, well, the loans, if they're made in 2020, have to be paid back in 2020 or th they have to be paid back to the feds, back to the treasury. And I'm just curious to know what, if there's been any kind of conversation in the administration about this kind of, this, this dilemma of, of what you're gonna call, what we would call this money. 
Uh, sure. Because yeah. speaking to speaking to Representative Gonzalez's thing, if it's a, if it's a grant with a small ten percent match to any landlord, private or public, it what is that? What does that do in terms of our leverage uh, in making sure that these units are used for what they're intended? <clears throat> Right. So, uh, you know, we've talked about switching this program to entirely grant because of the issues with not really sure about loans, if we can pull this off across the whole spectrum, you know, business assistance, whatnot. There's a lot of good reasons to use loans. They, you know, test for viability and they hold accountability. And but, you know, there's been um, concerns about our ability to do that. And I think that you could structure this um, rehousing program to uh, entirely with grants where you up the grant amount for commitments on homeless, you know, those that are rehousing homeless and they're, you know, connected with the service provider and MOU rental assistance matched up and those that um, are grants with a commitment on uh, affordability, keeping the, the rents affordable for a period of time and you can give a grant, but you can still take, you know, some sort of paper on that property, some sort of, um, you know, we do it with CDBG grants all the time that there's, there's a, you know, essentially the municipality, whoever's running it, you know, some sort of lean on the property till those commitments are met. Um, so I, I think that that can be, that can be worked out. Okay. Cause I, I, um, you know, the, the, I, this is a hard thing to just say, here's, here's more candy. Um, yeah, and- I mean, I, 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 I did, I would, I mean, I would push back on that if 19,000 of those units were in decent shape, we would have places to house people today and we wouldn't need to spend as much money to recreate and that this problem is just going to get worse. You know, we've lost as much housing each year as we're building with our $80 million investments each year. That's yeah. going to, that's predicted to continue for the next five years straight. So we're not getting ahead. We're falling behind and a small investment in helping the 85% of rental properties that are privately owned that serve many low income people is slipping us by. And I, I think we're missing uh, a real chance to make a difference. That's I, I've been in and doing this for 15 years. Uh, I, and- I don't just, dis- I, I, I don't just, dis- no, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I just think that the idea that the idea is that um, I mean, here's here's one, though, I mean, with the grant with the grant issue. I mean, housing this population, this money is being used specifically, um, as David Hall pointed out, it's going to be used for a very limited population of people and they're very difficult to house. And we heard from we've heard from landlords for the for as long as I've been in the building, private landlords in particular, that. Um, if I, yes, it would be nice to have a master lease program. Uh, yes, it would be nice to have a risk pool. Cause I mean, for instance, and this goes into like, well, what do we call services, you know, or what do we call uh, capital reserves? This conversation that we've had about the VHTB proposals mm-hmm. is saying, you know, does, does a private landlord want to, uh, rent to someone who may, have a bad day and do an incredible amount of damage, physical damage to their property. Um, it takes a special landlord to be able to persevere with that. And part of the having a master lease program, the way that Washington County Mental Health, for instance, has is um, is uh, uh, saying that we'll pay for those damages. But that's having a reserve fund. So I'm just curious. You know, I wonder if um, and and I, I'm afraid the answer will probably be no. But saying, well, if this grant, if you get an, if you get a grant, here's also some extra money to put aside, or here's access to a risk pool program that might make it easier for a private landlord to to fulfill that obligation. You know, it's it's you know trying to help them out is is. Uh, it's an interesting balance. It's an interesting right. thing to try to figure out. I mean, out. we've been talking about uh, something like that for, for a few years, that if we had some sort of loss reserve um, that, that landlords that could access that had damage, they would, they would do this again. If, if they could recoup damages, it's just, it's, it doesn't exist in a large way. And that, you know, I, I would, you know, argue that, you know, look at the pathways proposal, look at the groups, they are rehousing homeless folks now 
in private properties every day. I mean, this is how you find units because the, you know, affordable units, are, there's hardly any vacancy. So th th this is what's left in order to house our most vulnerable in, in most cases. And it's substandard and it's not getting better and we're not spending any money to address it. So I think we just keep getting worse and worse. And, and, you know, I, I know that, you know, there's some hesitancy about giving a grant to a private owner, um, but you know, we're all getting mortgage, you know, it's up, we're, we're all getting, um, support in some way for, for, for housing across the board. And that, you know, the, the reduced rents commitment, the, the risk here and, the um, increase in these property values, if, you know, for community members is, I think it's worth that limited funding when you look at what the alternatives are and what they cost and that, you know, even with the proposals you've talked about earlier, you know, with, with, you know, changing some motels, doing some rehab, helping to house folks 150 to 200, you know, with VHCB, it leaves a lot more room for more need. And those costs, you know, being what they are, there's not enough money left in this budget to do much more than that. And so, you know, this is pretty efficient. Um, it's, and it hasn't been done in 25, 30 years. You know, there used to be programs like this 30 years ago, where private properties were rehabbed with federal funds, grants were forgiven. Richard Williams ran them, Earhart ran them. Um, this was pretty standard 25, 30 years ago. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's, there's time and there's some room for some of this assistance if we don't want to keep going backwards on our, on our housing stock. We can't build our way new out of, out of our uh, affordable housing crisis. Thank you. Um, no, and thank you. That's very, that's an eloquent way of putting it. And, it's, and it's, I appreciate the reminder, especially that, that programs did have some success 30 years ago. I mean, there were some issues too, but there was some success in those programs and that's important to, um, it's important to appreciate. I am, uh, going to pass the microphone to Wendy, um, again, being sensitive to the time on a Friday afternoon. Um, go ahead, Wendy. So am I, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to respond to a couple of different things that were talked about. Um, one is whether you can name VSHA, and I was glad that Richard was able to talk to his attorney before coming here today. I hope you will name both VSHA, and if you go with the foreclosure, um, VHFA, because I think it'll just speed up the process. In both of these arenas, particularly in the rent arrears, we really need some. Um, money and, and frankly assurance. Uh, it'll have a calming effect just you uh, next Wednesday saying we this is a priority for us. We do have some uh, draft language for David if you want us to give it to him that would take his bill and take our proposal and sort of mesh it in a, in a way that we think gives enough guidance to um, VH, VSHA that they would not need to do rulemaking in order to implement the program. Um, I want to say on the foreclosure front that I was sort of, you know, there are a lot of people that are in forbearance right now, and some of them will stay in it for many years. I was glad to hear about the counseling because that's money that's not, um, that Josh talked, no, yeah, Richard talked about, Josh talked about, um, but that's money that doesn't have to be spent by 1230, and that will help the people whose forbearance dates come up after the first of the year. So that is great for them. Um, but in the meantime, even though there are uh, forbearance requirements, particularly at the national level, there are national servicers who are giving people misinformation about how, how long they can get a forbearance. And so it's really important that we have some resources in place for people to get the information they need to challenge the services who are saying they owe the money now, even though in fact, under federal law, they cannot be doing that. We heard from uh, one counseling um, at Opportunities Bank yesterday who said that sometimes it takes two or three months to convince a servicer that they cannot proceed the way they're proceeding. And it's just incredibly time consuming. And as far as the- um, Wendy, yeah. Wendy, before you go too far, just a clarification a mortgage servicer, are those the people that if I take a loan out from, you know, uh, the, my local Vermont bank and they sell the mortgage, is that who we're talking about? So they're, they're selling the, they're selling the mortgage to a servicer. 
Yes. I so it's that one true. step removed from the people I originally worked with. I just want to make that clear to people that, right. for, for myself, actually. But Right. And I think that the, the local banks here are working very well with their um, clients or their, you know, the people that they've lent money to. And so that's not really the issue. The issue is the people who are getting hammered by the national ones who actually, because it's a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac loan or whatever, they are not allowed to proceed, but they are telling people they're going to proceed. And so they're not giving them the forbearance rights that they have a right to. And as far as the um, 8 million to uh, local landlords, I mean, one thought I had, Josh talked about uh, looking at where are we spending all of this money by, you know, maybe in September and is it the right balance between foreclosure and lender, I mean, um, private landlords, I think, you know, just having a, a requirement that a private landlord have a letter of intent to apply for that 8 million very early on would help and having to have a specific plan um, again would help because frankly, we don't know if there's going to be 2 million requested or 10 million requested under that grant. We do have concerns um, that wh whatever amount of money goes out of that 8 million pot identified by the governor will um, not maintain its affordability um, or not maintain its, its um, used to low income and homeless people. So that is an area of concern for us. That was pretty much what I wanted to say. Okay. Um, oh, it's 3.30. It is, it is 3.30. Um, so I think from a brain being full day, I think I'm gonna leave it there. We have a lot of thinking to do. Um, I want us, homework is gonna be looking at, in, in, in particular, looking at the VLA times two proposal um, that Wendy's talking about with the concerns that she just mentioned. It's looking at Josh's document from today on the foreclosure. Um, concepts include, do we, ask David to create language that is, um, uh, and, I, and I think I need to send David an email um, because he wasn't able to get us that language today. But I think we, you know, I think we agreed that the $23 million um, fast track is the way to go. As soon as we get the language, uh, as soon as I see the language, I'll share it. But, um, but again, we have the opportunity to see that when it comes back next week. Um, and then do we, how do we create the language that, or make the decision, do we wanna craft language that says this unnamed agency, but the agency that only fits this criteria is gonna be the agency that covers the foreclosures or the mortgage or the uh, rental. So those are things to think about for Tuesday. Um, it's a lot, and I think we're going to get pretty crispy by the time 10.30 rolls around or, or, or so on Wednesday. So just be prepared to have our tempers be short and our patients be frayed, and um, let's just do good work. So do some homework this week. And John, you have a comment before we go. Yes, you know, I, I, I'm new to all of this for requests for proposals. And I wonder if Josh could send us the language the state uses that narrows the scope of um, organizations that might be applicable for us just to see that and if that's the way to go or if it is that we designate these two agencies we've been discussing. I just don't know what, you know, I think we all want to be efficient and accomplish exactly what the administration wants to do in this. But so I don't really know what the options are without seeing how the state would narrow it first. So we, we, we could send some language, you know, and I've seen it all the time in legislation where you say, you know, this redevelopment project in this Northeast Kingdom town that has this, and it can only be talking about Newport, but you never say the city of Newport. Um, and we, we can easily craft some and include it in the, the link, provide it to you and David to look at if you want to use it as an alternative to actually naming the group. Um, I know that on the, the better places, the community sort of investment, 
five million that's in the governor's Corona uh, relief ask is doing just that for an administrator of the program that speaks to a, a statewide charitable organization. And when you drill down to it, there's only one that would be eligible, but it doesn't outright name them. Well, that, that would be helpful for us just to see, Josh, I think, because that's okay. simple. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, anything you go want to leave me with before we go? Thank do, you so much. Do you want to go over the schedule for next week just to give them the dates and times? Oh, yeah. Sure. Do you have them in front of you or do, you, do I need to um, find them I, up? I have it. Uh, We're actually going to see each other every day next week, um, except for Monday. Um, um, no, I, I have it. I can read it off. Yeah, please do. Just a moment. Just a second. Get back to that page. Okay. It's coming. I'm just calling it up. Do you want to take us off the air? Sure. At the same time? I can do Can you that. do two? And for the witnesses who are here, um, thank you very much for, for being present.